Good morning. Welcome. It's so good to see your faces. We are going to give everyone a chance to find us here. And then we will officially begin. So come on in, say hello in the chat, and let me know where you are watching from. I'm seeing the emojis, I'm seeing people starting to say hello. It's great to see you guys. Where are you watching from? So I'm in Los Angeles, Jennifer's in Arkansas. Great to see familiar faces. Hi guys, Toronto, Canada's here. Wayne, Indiana's here. Michigan's in the house. Anyone here from, let's see, who's the furthest away from me? Orlando's here, Canada, Maryland, New York City. California, San Diego, Pennsylvania. Welcome, guys. North Dakota, Boca Raton, where I grew up. Virginia, London, UK. Great to see you. I'm so looking forward to spending this time together. It's going to be so, so sweet. Just be prepared. Some of you who don't even know each other are going to become friends over this next week. And some of you are going to become friends and have that friendship for, for years to come. It happens every time we do a workshop. Just watch. Uh, so welcome. Welcome, welcome. We're going to give everyone like 30 more seconds. And then we will officially begin. So hello and hello to everybody in the VIP Zoom room. Scotland. Oh, my gosh. All right. I think that that's definitely the furthest. Um, Winnipeg, Canada. Awesome. So I'm just going to give everybody like 10 more seconds to find out that we're live so that we can start. Does everybody have a piece of paper and a pen? Because that might come in handy. So you might want to get that. Maybe a glass of water. Okay, good. Thank you, Siri. She said she loves my shirt. Veronica Beard. Love that. Love that brand. Um, we are going to give away an Apple desktop computer today. We already, we have the winner. And if that person is here live, they will get it. If not, we have backup names, but uh, we're going to be doing giveaways every day this week. There'll be giveaways uh, for tomorrow and the next day. So stay tuned. And Typically, we uh, we actually come back Thursday and Friday as well to do a little after party. So it's going to be giveaways all week long. So, all right. Well, since it is now 9.03, uh, I think we can get started. So let's begin. Hi, guys. I'm Kathy Heller. I host a podcast. I wrote this book. It's called Don't Keep Your Day Job. Uh, it's all about turning your your gifts, your passions, your purpose into prosperity. And uh, I'm here with such, such a love for you. And I can't wait to spend this time together. And so we're going to dive in. The very first thing that I'm going to have you do is close your eyes. Close your eyes for a second. And I want you to, first of all, take a deep breath. We forget to breathe. Let's just take a deep breath. Good. I want you to ask yourself, what did you come here to hear? Why did you sign up for this? What is it that's been whispering to you? What is the reminder that you need? What did you come here to hear? All right, now you can open your eyes. So I want you to remember that. If you feel like sharing that in the chat, feel free. But essentially, I want to remind you that if anything that I say feels true, if there's any kind of light bulb or aha, it's because you knew that already, right? So much of becoming who we really are is shedding and unbecoming all the things that somehow got sort of stuck in our minds that aren't us. You know, there's an amazing book by Bronnie Ware, it's about the greatest regrets of the dying. She was on my podcast. She was a hospice nurse for years. And she talked about how 
in people's last moments, the very biggest regret they have is not living life on their terms and rather living a life that somebody else wanted them to live. And so I think for all of us, there's this whisper in our soul that's constantly tugging at us and reminding us to remember, to remember why we're here, to remember that we're each needed. You know, each of us is needed. A good example I like to use, I have three daughters and they love to do puzzles, especially my youngest who's seven. And I don't know when the last time he did a puzzle was, but if you ever do a puzzle, if ever there's a piece missing, which for us happens all the time. My husband's always like, I tell you, put it in a Ziploc. You're going to lose a piece. And he's very like into like, you know, the practical and the organization. And he's right. Because if you've ever done a puzzle and you get to this point where you realize you're missing even one piece, even one, let's say the piece is in the corner or the piece is in the center or the piece is sort of down by the lower part of it, that one missing piece feels so, it's just, it's just big. It's glaring at you, right? You know that feeling. It's so unsatisfying, right? We are each a piece of this puzzle. We are each needed in this orchestra. That's why you're here. The reason you are here is because you're needed and you know that. In fact, they've done studies now. Harvard just did a huge study on happiness. And I had the man who wrote this book on it, Bob Waldinger on the podcast. And he said what they found out about happiness is that it's actually purpose. It's actually contribution. You know, they did a different study and they used some of that data and that other study they did at Harvard, they brought people to Harvard and said, do you want to be happier? And they said, yes. And they said, great. So we're going to spend a week with you and we want you to tell us everything that would make you happier. And people said, I'd like to get better sleep. I'd like to have more money. I'd like to have whatever it was. And so they gave them all the things that they wanted. And what happened at the end of the week? Were they happier? The answer is no. So then the people at Harvard said, we want you to come back next week and we want to do something different. We want to see if it works. And instead of asking them what would make them happy, they asked them, what do you think you could do for someone else this week? And people made a list. And so people gave of themselves to other people. They gave money away instead of receiving money. They held the door for people. They showed up and offered their own presence, their own compassion, their own empathy to other people. And what happened at the end of that week? They were happier. We can go deeper with that. Each of us has unique gifts. Each of us has talents in ways that other people have other talents. Some people have this innate ability to listen with their whole hearts. Some people have this just innate ability to connect people. Some people have this ability to draw things and to paint things. Some people have this innate ability to bake things and to cook things. There's a reason for it. We each are a piece of the puzzle that is needed to make the world whole. And there's a part of each of us that knows that. And every day that goes by that we don't feel like we are walking in purpose, that we are playing in our zone of genius, there is a sadness because we desire to be fully expressed, to be fully found, and to fully contribute to the world. Type a one in the chat if that feels true for you. So what I'm here to do is to help sort of take your sunglasses and, and, and clear off the dust so you can see clearer, right? To, to help you see 
further, to help widen your perception so that you see reality as it actually is. So often when I meet people and they tell me that they want to be more fulfilled and I ask them, what is it that they want? So often there are these two giant limiting beliefs that keep people in the same hamster wheel. One of those beliefs is the belief that I am not enough. Sure, I wish I could be writing books. Sure, I wish I could open a bed and breakfast. Sure, I wish I could be like Rachel Ray, but I am not enough. Here's how I am deficient. So one of the main beliefs that keeps us from living in our purpose is not feeling like we are enough, not expert enough, not ready enough, not prepared enough, not certified enough, not enough. The second belief that is fake news is it's not possible. It's not possible. Your brain will look for the evidence of whatever it is you tell it. So if you tell yourself something like, all people in Los Angeles are superficial, then your brain will show you evidence that everyone in Los Angeles is superficial. But if your brain said something to you like, all people in Los Angeles are super spiritual, your brain would show you the evidence of that. You're like, oh yeah, LA has all these yoga studios and green juices. And I'm making all of these things up, obviously, but my point is the same. Your mind will show you the evidence of whatever you tell it is true. And so this week, what I want to do with you is help you see clearly all that is possible and all that you are. I want to remind you of what you already know, but I want to help you see further than you saw before. And I just want to let you know that we do workshops like this about four times a year for different kinds of things. And this is sort of my favorite thing to do in the world. Um, short of like being with my kids and my husband and, you know, hanging out on the couch. This is my second favorite thing to do more than, more than anything, more than shopping, more than going to a movie, more than taking some amazing trip. I'd rather be with you guys. So we do these workshops and these workshops are meant to give you this, this renewed sense of courage, this renewed sense of clarity and action that you can take. And so we're going to have a lot of fun together. And for some of you, this is going to fill you up and you're going to be on your way. And maybe you'll just hang out with me by listening to my podcast, which by the way, it's free. It comes out two to three times a week. And we've done 800 episodes and we've interviewed some of the most amazing people in the world, like Deepak Chopra and Marianne Williamson and Matthew McConaughey and Harry Connick Jr. And all these people just want to shower you with love and ideas and it's such a good thing and I'm so grateful I started that show so some of you will just hang out with me there and some of you are going to say Kath I want to be in this with you and by the end of this week I will tell you all the ways that I coach people and all the ways that we have programs and retreats and if that's something that you guys want at the end of this week I will be sure to tell you all about that but for now I'm hoping that this week alone provides you with the clarity and insight and guidance and action for you to be in a better place at the end of this workshop than you felt like you were. So I'm so glad that you're here. So let's begin. Let's begin with a concept, okay, called Ikigai. How many of you type a one in the chat if you know this word? If you've been hanging out with me, then you do know this word. If you've been reading a lot of good books, then you do know this word. Ikigai is a Japanese word, and it is such a beautiful way of understanding our assignment in life, right? We've all been given an assignment, and that assignment is to live into our potential and to serve the world with our unique capacities. Ikigai is the combination of three points. It's where three things intersect that allows us to have the clues as to what it is that God assigned for us. Each one of us was given this assignment. Each one of us is called to step up and to offer the world our uniqueness. This is how we understand it from a Japanese perspective. What is those three things? What are they? Number one, what are you good at? Number two, what do you love to do? 
Number three, here's the kicker. What does the world need most? Where those three things come together is what you were assigned. Now, number one, I said, what are you good at? Number two, what do you love? Why? Because if there's something you're good at, but you don't love it, that's not your guy. Some kids are really good at math, but they might not love it. So maybe being a CPA is not their purpose in life, right? Some kids love maybe playing the bassoon, but they're not that good at it. So maybe that's not their purpose in life, right? It's where these three things come together. It's where these three things come together. And so I want to ask you, if you have a pen and paper right now, I want you to think about if you didn't listen to the fake news in your head that tells you that you're not good enough and that things aren't possible. And if you could just be coming from that intuitive place, what would be five dreams, five dreams that you would have if you could just kind of blurt them out? What would be five dreams? What would it be? Would you be travel writing, opening a bed and breakfast in the South of France, um, opening a, uh, having a clothing line, um, uh, being a podcaster? What would be five dream lives? Just write those down. What would be five? Five things. And maybe there's only one. Maybe there's only three. It doesn't matter. I'm just curious because there is something in there. So I want you to write that down. And if anyone feels like sharing in the chat, please do. So Rachel said, writing her book. Marilyn said, charter a cruise ship for life coaches. Um, helping kids and adults navigate through trauma and find good and the bad. Um, hi, Oswald. Oswald said, I'm good at writing and photography. I love to tell stories. The world needs hope, light, and resilience in heavy times. Podcaster, keynote speaker, helping others, hosting wild women retreats, philanthropist, studying history and teaching it, own a new age spiritual store. Awesome. So one of the reasons I started my podcast is because I wanted to show people evidence of what's possible. A friend of mine, Alex Benayan, told me the story. He wrote a book called The Third Door. It's an amazing book. But he told me a story about um, Teach for America. And some of you might know what Teach for America is. And there was a teacher at Teach for America teaching a class, and it was second grade. And the teacher asked the kids to draw a picture of what they wanted to be when they grew up. And kids started to draw. And one kid drew a astronaut, and one kid drew a, you know, uh, a marine biologist, a person with dolphins, and the kids were drawing. There was a kid at the back of the room who wasn't drawing anything. And the teacher walked over and said, Jake, what's up? And he's like, I can't think of anything. And so she said, you know, whatever she could say to be encouraging. And she walked away and Jake drew something. And she came back and she said, what'd you draw? And he said, a pizza delivery guy. And she said, okay. And later that night, something about it struck her. So she called Jake's mom and she said, hey, I just wanted to have a conversation about your son. And I'm just curious, what do you think about this? And she asked the mom and the mom said, oh, well, I can tell you why that is. His dad left when he was very young and his dad is in prison. And his uncle is the only person who really comes to take care of him. And he's a pizza delivery guy. And my friend Alex had a conversation with the teacher. And what Alex said is that we as people reach for the highest branches that we can see. And so on my podcast, one of the things that I've been doing since I started it seven years ago is to show people evidence of all that is, all the highest branches that exist. Because when we see right? Like Moana could see further than the reef, then we have something to reach for. And so I asked James Clear this question. James Clear wrote a book called Atomic Habits. 
And I said to him, wow, this book is a New York Times bestseller and everyone's reading it. And there's so many habits that are so important. I said, what's the most important habit? And he said, you know, I thought a lot about that. And I used to think I couldn't pick the most important habit. He said, but now I know that there is one habit that is actually more important than all the rest. And that is who you spend time with. He said, because who you spend time with determines what you do and how you see the world. I don't know how many of you have been watching this incredible documentary that Dan Buettner put out. It's all about living into your hundreds. It's all about the blue zones. I had Dan Buettner on the podcast and he's such an extraordinary human being. And he used to work for National Geographic and he went all around the world looking for the communities where they had the largest population of people living in their hundreds. And he wanted to understand what were the things that they all had in common. And what they all have in common, there's a few things, he breaks them down into like five categories, but there's a sense of contribution and purpose. And there is a way in which the outlook is incredibly positive. In fact, we now know that disease is caused, every disease is caused by inflammation in the body. And we now understand that that inflammation is caused by cortisol from the brain. And so when there is more stress, every thought is connected to a chemical reaction. The more we think limiting and fearful things, the more cortisol is sort of dripping into every cell of our being. The more we open up our capacity to perceive from a place where we have an open heart and an open mind, we lower the cortisol, we lower the inflammation, and we start to literally biologically have an upgrade. And who we spend time with determines a lot about the way we see the world. And therefore, how we see, how we think, how we perceive, how we believe affects what we do. So our beliefs and our perception is what's in charge of our actions. And our beliefs and actions create our life that creates our life. And so most of the time people are living groundhog day because they think what they thought yesterday, they feel what they felt yesterday, and they take action the way they took yesterday. And therefore their life just stays in the same place. And so in this week, just like on this podcast of mine, I'm trying to show you, I'm trying to surround you with people who are seeing differently, therefore behaving and acting differently and therefore creating differently. We as human beings, we have the ability to go into a flow state. We have the ability to tap in and turn on our greater cognitive capacity. And the way that we do that is to turn down the amygdala, the fight, flight, or freeze response and move into a collective, more open, more receptive, more creative place. Most people don't know that Steve Jobs, for instance, was meditating for 15 years as a Zen meditator before he created his company, before Apple was born. A lot of people don't know that the, the coach of the Bulls and the Lakers had them meditating. Most people don't know that the number one thing that most of the people on my podcast have in common is some kind of meditation practice. Why is that? Because so often our mind is a blizzard. Our mind is very reactive. One of the things you'll come to know about me is I spent three years studying at UCLA's Mindful Awareness Research Center and learning so much about the mind and the body connection and meditation really helps you because if you don't become conscious of where your mind is running an unconscious script and program, you will be unconscious all day long. And so what we, we learn to do is to witness that busy mind and then be what is directing our attention, to focus our attention. And the more we focus our attention, the more we have dominion over our life. And so we start to see clearer, right? And that's why we're here. 
one of the things I want to tell you, for those of you who don't know, a little bit about my story. The reason this matters so much to me is because growing up in my house, my mom and dad had a really difficult, stressful, challenging marriage, to say the least. And they wound up getting divorced. But my entire life, I knew separate from my mom's pain about the marriage, she was so sad because she had all these dreams. She had all these dreams and talents, and she felt like they were collecting dust on a shelf. They were dying inside of her. When she was in high school, she was considered like the talented girl, right? She was the lead in every musical, in every play. She was that girl. And in her senior yearbook, she was like most likely to be, you know, this Broadway star kind of thing. She's you know, most talented, all those senior superlatives. Well, she's 76. So she tells me that when she was graduating from high school, women usually at that time had a choice, which was be a mom and have kids or go be a secretary or a nurse. Like there wasn't as much opportunity. There wasn't as much modeled then. But one of her friends who is actually her understudy, right? When you're ever in a play, there's usually somebody who's cast as the understudy in case you can't do the part. So this girl who was my mom's understudy decided to go to New York City and audition for Broadway. And my mom had a belief that in order for her to be a good mom and live a good life, she'd have to give up on her dreams. And me now having three daughters, that is something I very much want them to understand that they can both be who they want to be as a mom and as a wife, if they choose to want to do that. And they can also live their dreams. My mom's friend who went to New York City to audition for these shows actually got the leading role in a show called Little Shop of Horrors. And she went on to actually be the lead in the movie version of Little Shop of Horrors. So if anybody has ever seen that movie, her name is Ellen Green. My mom and her were friends in high school. And my whole life, I knew that story because I knew how much pain my mom was in from not feeling that she was seen, from not feeling that she was contributing her gift to the world. And that was always sort of a cautionary tale that I knew that one day, no matter what, I would find a way to feel like I was using my gifts because I didn't want to feel that feeling where we're sad, right? And I see that happen to a lot of people. I see people who they have some innate gift or thing that they're drawn towards when they're kids. And then somewhere along the way, they get told to forget it all and just get good grades and get this corporate job. And now they're 36 or 45 and they're walking to the office and there's just something inside of them that's breaking because they have done all the right things and they don't feel fulfilled. And that doesn't have to be the case. That doesn't have to be the case. So many of the people that have come on my show have sort of jumped out of that line, jumped off that hamster wheel and had the courage to go and pursue what it is that they love. And they've turned those things into the most fulfilling purpose-driven lives. The reason I call my book, Don't Keep Your Day Job, is because to me, a day job is usually synonymous with something that doesn't light you up. And wouldn't it be amazing if every one of us could do our life's work, could get paid to do our thing, then we would be on purpose every day, right? Then we wouldn't have to put it away for a rainy day or retirement. We could actually get better at it. We could actually find ways to get so good at doing the thing that we were meant to do because we're doing it all day long, right? And so what happened for me is I, um, I wound up coming out to Los Angeles with this dream of having a record deal. I always loved to sing and I always loved to write music since I was a kid. And I got out here and first I got a job because I didn't have money from 
you know, my parents were divorced. I had a single mom, but I got a job off of Craigslist. And then meanwhile, I was working on my music on, on the side every chance I had, and I was hustling. And I wound up writing mediocre songs and those mediocre songs got better. And finally, I got a record deal. I was actually sitting with Lady Gaga at Sunset Sounds and she was recording Paparazzi. And I had just gotten this invitation to come to Interscope. And I was working with Ron Fair and they were asking me what I wanted from Starbucks and I couldn't believe it. And it was real. And we had my songwriter friends and I had created this demo, which was pretty amazing. And I remember we wrote this song called Turn the Sunshine On and it had brass horns and I couldn't believe it. And my voice is a little bit like a combination of Natalie Merchant meets Colby Calais. It was like that kind of a voice. Anyway, so here I was and wind in my hair. And about six weeks later, I was driving on the 405, which is where most people spend most of their time in LA. And I got a call from Ron Fair and he's like, oh, you're in the car. Call me when you get home. And I was like, no, I want to talk now. So I get off the freeway at like Bundy and Olympic and I pull over and he says, listen, you have so much talent and we don't feel certain that these songs are radio singles. They're, they're better suited for like a soundtrack of a movie. And I don't think that we're going to go ahead and put this record out, but I wish you all the best. And I sat there in that car and I was crying and I thought, what am I going to do now? What am I going to do now? And so with a lot of sadness, I thought, oh, this is what everybody told me that one day, this is what it means to grow up and be real and let it go and be practical. And so that's what started to happen in my brain. And my friends told me, go make money, go get a real job, go do this, go do that. And I started to say to people, all right, well, if you don't pursue your dreams, how do you make money? And people said, well, you could work in finance. I'm like, well, I'm terrible at math. I'm not going to work in finance. Oh, well, the other most lucrative thing you could do is work in commercial real estate because people who sell hundred million dollars, you know, shopping malls make a lot of money. Well, sure enough, a few days later, I'm introduced to this guy who owns a commercial real estate firm. He was a lovely person and he invited me to come work for him. And so I'm working for this guy and he was very kind and very encouraging and he's paying me well to work for him. And I was able to buy a CLK Mercedes. It was like a two-door coupe and I was blasting my Gnarls Barkley and I got a couch from Anthropology, and I was eating sushi. And two years later, I was walking to the office and I saw the reflection of myself in the elevator doors and I started to cry because I didn't recognize myself because everything about my life was a lie because it wasn't me. And I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to wake up every day to do that. And I knew that I couldn't do that anymore. And so I walked into his office and I told him, I have to quit my job to save my life because I don't know who I am and I've lost my sense of self. And he was very kind and I left. And I remember I had heard this idea that if you, if you want to move your life forward, ask a better question, ask a better question than you've been asking. And so I wrote on a legal pad, is there any other way for me to do music? Is it record deal or nothing? And I started to research that question. And soon, very soon, within like a week, I read an article about indie artists who were licensing their music, Regina Spector, Ingrid Michelson, Snow Patrol. These, there were people who were licensing their songs to Grey's Anatomy and One Tree Hill. And I thought, what does it mean to license your song? Hmm. And so I started to study that. And I didn't have much time because I didn't have parents who could give me any money. It was really, it was like, gotta get, to, gotta get this together. And so I started reaching out to people who were what they call music supervisors, people who chose music for TV shows and ads and films. And I started to have conversations and those conversations led to opportunities. And I started to write music and sure enough, I 
wrote songs for TV shows. And so for a decade, I started writing songs for all these movies and all these shows. And then, and if you Google it, you could find it. Uh, and then I was featured in these full page stories in Billboard magazine, Variety magazine, uh, the LA Weekly, like these big full page stories about how I was very, very much a DIY artist. And without a record label, I was making $300,000 a year writing songs for television, film, and advertising. And I got married and I had two kids and it was the most amazing feeling in the world. It was like getting paid to do something I would do for free. It was like being at Disneyland every single day, but better. There's no lines and you don't have to pay $45 for uh, a popsicle. So I was having a blast. And eventually what started to happen is my creative friends in Los Angeles, my screenwriter friends, my actor friends, my friends who wanted to be in fashion were saying to me, how the hell did you do this? How did you take the bull by the horn, so to speak? And how did you direct your career in a career that's so competitive? And at first I was scratching my head, like, how do I surmise what it is that I did? And I thought about it and thought about it. And eventually I decided to put together a little workshop in my house where I taught 10 of my artist friends how they could take their artistry and turn it from a hobby into an actual business. And I realized what it was that I was doing to treat my craft like a business and to really get clear about what was most important and how to work smarter rather than harder and what it was that I did to make relationships with the right people and to understand what it is they needed. And I realized that business was about empathy. And it was that every time I called someone or spoke to somebody who worked for a TV show or who was working on an ad for Dr. Pepper or who was working on a movie, instead of just saying, listen to my music, listen to my music, I was saying, what song do you need? What story are you telling? How can I be a part of this? How can I support the greater vision? And I realized that all business is really that. It's understanding that if somebody's paying you for something, they need or want something. And so it is the great opportunity for us to make the relationship the priority. And so I started to understand that. And then I started to understand why people give up on their craft. And I read something that Ed Sheeran said. He was saying that so often people with so much talent, whether they're good at baking, good at playing guitar, good at anything, they give up and they give up way too soon. And he said, here's why. He said, if you would listen to the first songs he wrote and if he would have judged himself by those first songs, he wouldn't be where he is today. And he talks about this analogy. He says, have you ever gone to a cabin in the woods and you're staying there with your friends and nobody's been there for a few weeks and you turn on the faucet and the water is like brown sludgy water and you don't worry about it because you know if you just let that water run after a minute, that water is clear, but you got to run the water. And he said, when you are good at something, you need a minute to keep doing it until what is mediocre, but good becomes brilliant. And so everyone that you admire who is brilliant gave themselves the time to actually focus their attention there, right? And so, so much of becoming successful, especially with your gift, is having the courage and capacity to tolerate being mediocre in your greatest attempt and effort to become brilliant. And so my first songs, if you heard, if you go back and watch this replay, I said they were mediocre and then they got better. And I knew that my ability to hear something was better than what I was making at first, but eventually it got better. And it's the same thing with my podcast. I eventually started a podcast. I was, I had three kids and my youngest daughter was two weeks old. I was exhausted. I had every good excuse to not start a podcast. I said, again, I'm going to allow myself the grace to move from intention, to move from vision and to make the first 10 podcasts, however they're going to be made and the first 30 and the first 50. And I will keep making them until they become brilliant. And that podcast now has 50 million downloads. What happened is that podcast became so successful that it started making millions of dollars and it actually took over my music business 
because the podcast was the thing, right? And again, what I think is incredible is how our beliefs can really rob us of our lives because not only do you have gifts inside of you, you have multiple gifts inside of you. Most creative people don't just do one thing. They start by doing one thing and then they add a hyphen to their name. So they start by making cupcakes and then they start helping other female entrepreneurs open their businesses, or they start by being on the radio. Next thing they know, they have a record label. Next thing they know, they're making their own vodka. Creativity doesn't stop. We have the ability to open our minds and open our hearts to the ability where we can not only solve one problem, we can solve multiple problems. And the worst thing to do is to just sit there unconsciously scrolling your phone, being consumed by all that is coming through to the point where you wind up feeling this small and this helpless, and you only see this wide. The world is truly not net neutral, it's net positive. The amount of support that comes just inherently, you know, if I, if I get a cut on my hand, within seconds, my body starts to go into repair right? Everything is literally meant to constantly support our healing and our wholeness. And so you have so many gifts. You know, I asked Julia Cameron, she wrote a book called The Artist's Way. She's been on my podcast twice. It's a phenomenal book. And it's all about recovering your creativity. And I asked her, why do you think so many people don't live in their creativity? And she said, I'll tell you why. She said, have you ever been to a preschool classroom? And have you ever seen in that classroom that, hang on a second, I hear a little thing on the Zoom call. She said, have you ever been in a preschool classroom? And have you ever seen a preschooler who's not creative? The answer is no. Every kid wants to get into it. Every kid is willing to get paint in their hair, sand up their nose, because all they want to do is create. We are creative. And I mean, creativity is everything. It's not just painting. Creativity is starting any business. It's solving any problem. Creativity is finding any new way to innovate and move the world forward. We are creators. We came to the world to create. And she said, but here's what happens. Those preschoolers are wide open and all they want to do is be in alignment, creating and solving problems and finding new ways to, to be on this great adventure and, 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 and being willing to add their ideas. But by the time they're eight or 12 or 15, somebody comes along and shatters their heart. They feel rejected. And by the time that happens, they say, no more. I want to belong so badly that I will take this path. I want to be liked so badly. I don't want to ever be rejected. I don't want to ever put anything out there that is not perfect. And therefore, I will not add my ideas. And therefore, I will not be creative. And therefore, I will sit over here. My friend Mark Grove said to me that every single minute of the day, we are being given a choice, whether we know it or not, which is to be authentic or to belong. And he said, human beings, nine times out of 10, will choose belonging over authenticity. And so the people that you look up to who are creative have chosen to be authentic, which means Taylor Swift for years had to turn off the comments on her feed because of how much people were slamming her and she chose to keep going. It is not, it is not about belonging. It is about belonging to yourself because if you don't belong to yourself, then who do you belong to anyway? If you're not authentically yourself and somebody chooses you, then they're not choosing you anyway. And this is why at the beginning of today, I said that Bronnie Ware in her book about the greatest regrets of the dying said that the number one regret most people have is that they didn't live life on their terms. So now more than ever, we are being called to be authentic, to be creative to be innovative, to solve problems. Angela Duckworth was on the podcast and she wrote a book called Grit. And she did this very, very popular TED talk about grittiness. 
And she said that what we understand from successful people, the people who've moved civilization forward is that they had grit. But here's what she said. She said, when they studied grit, which they now know is resilience, here's what they understand. The number one thing, the number one thing that correlates to grit, to resilience is optimism. Because in order for you to be resilient, you have to be able to see the vision. You have to be able to see the possibility. Otherwise you will give up. And so each one of us is being asked at every moment to have the ability to see the possibility. The reason why somebody would continue to be gritty in a lab, somebody who's being given the, the test of finding a cure for cancer, the reason that they can be gritty and have resilience is because every day, you know what they're saying to themselves? It's here. I know it's here. That's another clue. That's another clue. Because if they give that up, if they give up that optimism, they will not stay in it. And if they don't stay in it, there won't be a cure. And so every single time you hear your mind telling you it's hopeless, there's no reason to, no, that is the wrong path. The path is to say every day I'm being given clues. Every day the world is there whispering me forward, showing me ways forward. And when you look for it, you will find it. So I want you to think for a second. I want you to think for a second about you at seven years old. Can you picture yourself? Do you have an image that comes to mind? Did you have pigtails? Were you missing a tooth? Did you have this pair of red sneakers you love? Picture yourself. And I want you to picture that kid. And I want you to remember how effortless it is to see that kid's goodness. And I want you to picture that that kid had that vision. That kid saw their future. That kid had no problems seeing and believing that they were lovable and that they could love and that they could make things and that one day all their gifts could be used for good. So what happened is along the way, your mind created an unconscious story and that story has told you in some way, shape or form for years, you're not enough and it's not possible. And that is an actual lie. You're more than enough and it is completely possible. And it's important, right? I think a lot of times when people say they wanna change the world, the best way to look at that is that we are being asked to change one person's world every day. That every day, you can't necessarily change a world of 8 billion people. But if every day you change one person's world, that is a whole world. And how do you do that? By you standing here, by you understanding that you cultivating your gifts is a gift to the world, right? You being on purpose every day, right? Is a way to change the world. And the reason why I keep talking about it in terms of business is because then you'll actually be in it all the time, right? You'll be doing your pottery all the time. You'll be writing music all the time. You'll be working on that business. You'll be coaching. You'll be doing whatever it is all the time and you'll get paid to do it. And can you imagine, can you just see for a second, what, what would it feel like if a year from now, you woke up every day using your gifts and getting paid to do what you love to do. How would that change your life? How would that change the world? It would change the world in a masterful way. That is the answer. So I wanna tell you a couple of things. Number one, for those of you in the VIP Zoom room, um, after this ends, I will be with you guys and we're gonna do a meditation together. And we're gonna do some Q and A together. By the way, if anybody wants to join us there, you can go to kathyhammer.com slash upgrade and join us in the VIP room. And we're going to give away a Apple computer in a minute. And I'm going to tell you about the next giveaway. I want you to know one thing, which is um, you're going to have giveaways every day. We're going to post homework in the Facebook group. And those of you who do the homework, 
we'll always choose like three of you and then you'll be given something just for doing your homework. And there'll also be extra giveaways. And one of the extra giveaways that I wanna tell you about right now is if you take a screenshot right now and you post about this on your Instagram and you tag me and you just write one, one aha, one light bulb that you got from this, you'll be entered to win a $50 Amazon gift card and we'll pick five of you who do that. So you can go ahead and do that if you want to and just tag me on Instagram at kathy.heller. So I want you to think for a second. I want you to think for a second because the stakes are really high. This is your life, right? Every single day that goes by, when is it going to be your day? You remember in the Goonies, he was like, down here, it's our time. Up there, it's their time. This is your time. This is your time, right? And everybody's asking these big questions, right? About what can we do to bring goodness and peace and loving kindness to the world? It begins with each one of us being in alignment, each one of us being peaceful. And I'll tell you something that Mother Teresa said. Mother Teresa, she said, it takes a checkbook to change the world. And so one of the things I'd like to see is I'd like to normalize women making millions and millions of dollars, right? So that they have big fat checkbooks and that they can create and do and add and offer and be in leadership. I would love to see that happen. And I wanna talk to you about that this week. And so today I'm showing you one, one insight, right? Into what it is that you have inside of you and how important it is, how urgent it is that you live in that. And I'm showing you this example, right? Of multiple different things that help you to see further. Tomorrow, we're gonna to talk about these things becoming a business. And what does that look like? And what's the beginning of that? And how could you be having a business where you just love organizing or you just love vegan cooking or you just love helping women in their, in their journeys uh, about through postpartum? I'm gonna show you the, the ways in which we take a few courageous, decisive steps, and that turns into a business. And then on the third day, on Wednesday, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about money, making money. We're going to talk about all the things that can allow us to actually make money by being in service and to create businesses that are dripping with integrity. You know, I had Kendra Scott on my podcast and she's running a business that makes billions with a B. She has given more money to women and to women-owned businesses every year than anyone. She has pump stations all along the floors of every office building. She has all these policies that help women to find balance in their lives. This is positive. She started out actually selling hats. That hat business led her to selling jewelry because the hat business wasn't taking off. And somebody said to her at one of the places she went to sell the hat, who made your earrings? And she was holding her little baby in the baby Bjorn. And she said, oh, maybe I should sell the earrings. And one step, one courageous step led to a billion dollar business. And that billion dollar business is now helping so many other women start their businesses. The amount of possibility and courage is all within you. You have that radical courage. You are sweet, but you're also powerful. You are kind, but you're also super creative. And I want to show you how to open yourself up so that you can harness these gifts. So I want you to do me a favor for the sake of that seven-year-old kid. I want you to write yourself right now a permission slip for the rest of this week and for the rest of hopefully time. And I want you to write a letter to yourself. So dear Kathy, dear Annie, write it to yourself. Dear Jennifer, dear Kelly, write it to yourself. I give you permission to follow your heart. I give you permission to make mediocre things so that you can make brilliant things. I give you permission to see further 
than your mind tells you to see. I give you permission to remember, to remember. I give you permission to play and sign it. I want you to keep that with you throughout this workshop. Every one of us is that missing puzzle piece. Every one of us. You know, when I was in college, I wound up going on a trip to Jerusalem for three weeks and I stayed there for three years. And I remember my rabbi said to me, we are each a masterpiece, a piece of the master. There's just this oneness. And each one of us is needed in this orchestra. And it doesn't matter if you're the triangle or you're the piano or you're the guitar, every single instrument plays a different note. And every single one of us has something unique. You know, when I started the podcast, people said to me, oh, you're going to start a podcast in 2017. There's already thousands and thousands of podcasts. Why would you do that? Everybody's already said it. Because you are unique. Because no one has had your exact perception and your exact life experiences. And so it's different. You know, one of my favorite things to do with my kids is we listen to We Are the World. Remember that song, of course. And we listen. And without me looking, I say to them, I call out the names of the artists. I go, Huey Lewis, Ray Charles, Billy Joel. Like I call out Michael McDonald, right? And as you listen, you realize that even though this group of people, you could say, what's the point? It's all the same. They're all making music around the same. Nope. Each one of them, you can tell their voice. It's different. It is different. Stevie Wonder comes on, you go, oh my God, how could we have lived without Stevie Wonder? Bob Dylan comes on, you go, what would the world be without Bob Dylan? Every one of those voices is not the same. It's not. Every one of those voices adds a different piece to the puzzle, just like you do. But what you've done for so long is you go into this learned helplessness where you say, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It 100% matters. And every day, our greatest assignment is not even the goal. It's who we become in chasing the goal because your soul satisfaction is in showing up more as your authentic, true self every single day. And so I want you to start to think about it. And one piece of homework for you is I want you to ask three people who you love, what are things that they come to you for? What are things that they feel you do well. And I want you to tell them things that they do well too. Why not? Three people I want you to text and I want you to say, hey, is there something that comes to mind that you think that I do well? For instance, with you, and I want you to tell them whatever that is. I want you to tell them you're the person I go to for relationship advice, or you're the person I go to when I need a great recommendation for travel, or you're the person I go to when I wanna know what I should wear that's in my closet. I want you to start to look for clues of things that you ignore. See, things that we do really well are sort of hidden in plain sight because you just think, well, that's not a big deal. But what if it is a big deal? What if your capacity to make the best chocolate chip cookies in the world would lead to making people happy on Main Street? And what if that is a very honest, beautiful, good thing for you to be doing, which would make you happy, which would make the world happy? I want you to be in that purpose every single day. I want you to get paid to be on purpose. If thoughts turn to things, let's start holding the thought that we can do what we love, that we can be in our ikigai because it will serve the world for us to get paid to do what we love because then we'll get better and better and better at serving the world. And that is what we're gonna talk about as we continue to go through this week. And for anybody who wants to Go further at the end of this workshop. I will, I will talk to you about, we do a whole three month workshop. Some of you will be like, I'm gonna be in that with you. Some of you will get everything you need from these three days. You get to choose your own adventure. We'll talk about it then. Let's now give away the computer. Are you guys excited? So remember, I want you to stay tuned to the Facebook group because there will be homework. And then you will choose. we will choose three of you who do your homework and there will be a giveaway tomorrow for three of you who do your homework. 
I also want to remind you that anyone who takes a screenshot right now and posts it on your Instagram and tags me so I can see it and writes one thing that is a breakthrough for you from this workshop, you might want to invite other people to come take the workshop. It's free if you feel like it's helpful for people. We will choose five of you and give you a $50 Amazon gift card. Um, and if anybody wants to upgrade to stay with me, I'll be on for another hour in the Zoom room for Q&A and meditation. You can go to kathyhow.com slash upgrade to do that. Okay, so here is the winner. And every time we announce winners, just to be extra, extra fair, we want that person to be here live. If that person is not here live, we have backups, but we will give it to whoever is here live because we want to reward you for taking the time out of your very busy life to show up. Before I offer the winners, I just want to say thank you for all the incredible comments. Thank you for all the generosity. It is not lost on me. People talk about how the internet is such a this kind of place and that kind of place. And I come into these groups and I'm just so grateful that you are sent to me and people are so incredibly kind. All right. So the winner of the Apple computer, I hope, let us know if you're here live to claim your prize is Aubrey, A-U-B-R-I, Gib, G-I-B-B. I, -B -B. I want to say congratulations to you if you're here. If you're not here, let us know because we have backup winners. We'll give it a second to make sure that that person is here. We'll give it a second. Um, and we have so much more to dive into. Type a one in the chat if you will be here tomorrow where we will talk about how to take these incredible gifts and take the first steps to turning those into a business and what that gets to look like. It's gonna be really fun. Um, and let me ask you another question. We're just waiting to see if Aubrey is here. If Aubrey is not here, I will announce the other backup winners. Um, let me ask you, whenever you, when, when you asked yourself at the beginning, what did you come here to hear? Did you wind up hearing some of what you came here to hear? So I haven't seen Aubrey yet claim the prize, but I could be, oh no, Aubrey, you're there, you're there, you're there. Congratulations. I see you, I see you. Congratulations, that's awesome. See, synchronicity. Well, stay tuned because we're gonna have more giveaways tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Um, for those of you who do your homework, you'll see every single day this week, There'll be some really juicy things given away, including uh, a Kendra Scott pair of earrings and a necklace. There'll be beautiful things like that. There'll also be um, gift cards. There'll be lots of fun. There'll be Marc Jacobs totes, lots of fun things. Um, and so this was, this was an awesome day one, but we have so much more to cover. And if you feel like this was helpful, if you feel like this was useful, uh, go ahead then and tell your friends to join you here tomorrow. So yes, uh, my team just let me know that um, for tomorrow, you're going to see, uh, we're going to give away Mark Jacobs tote bags. So whoever does their homework today, will choose three of you and each of you will get this beautiful Mark Jacobs tote, which is just so cute. Um, so stay tuned for looking for your homework. And, um, I so appreciate this time. I'm going to now pop into the VIP room and spend some time meditating with them and answering questions. I love you guys so much. Uh, it was really just such a joy to be with you and we'll be back here tomorrow and I hope to see you then.